Right, the controversial gay marriage bill will have its first reading in Parliament tonight and this morning we're running a poll on our Facebook page asking you if you think same-sex couples should be allowed to marry. So do hop online and vote. The team joins us now on the couch to have a look at the issue. Uh, Tommy, you wrote an, an excellent article in the newspaper yesterday. Can you summarise that for us briefly? Oh, yes, yeah, summary, yeah, OK. Um, I... I brought my mum into it, my mum and dad, because I thought that by relaying my experience, you know, maybe it might help to broaden the, um, the enlightenment of the debate. Um, basically, for me, I wrote that as I've grown up, things have been changing. Yeah. When I first came out to mum and dad, it was quite a big thing because they had this issue. They thought I'm, I was never going to be able to have kids. Uh, they were never going to have grandchildren. I was never going to be able to get married. Um, I would end up old and alone because uh, not too far before I actually came out to them had it been uh, had the homosexual law reform bill passed, and so therefore it started breaking down barriers and saying, you know, it's actually okay. So. I've grown up with my parents, you know, that they've been of their old schools mm. thinking that's how it's going to be, you know, unfortunately I was going to be relegated to this other life, which wasn't going to be very nice and very happy, but laws have changed over that time, you know, um, it's been okay, it's, it's no longer okay to discriminate, uh, you can have a civil union, um, but I think that this whole marriage thing is actually kind of the last bastion for um, putting gay people in the eyes of the country into the normal category. So, so for you, because when you got married, we all talked about it as a wedding, but it is a civil union. Personally, what difference does it make to you if you get to say you're married? Yeah, it's a big difference because when you say you're married, it engenders all of that. It, 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 it gives me memories of my parents, you know, living through their 37 years of their strong marriage. Civil union to me doesn't, doesn't mean anything. And like I said in the article, it's just plonky to say as well. I just hate saying that I'm civil union. And it actually has no meaning, no depth to me. Um, I do want to be able to get married. And I'll be uncivil unioned in a second if I could get married. You told Tim that, yeah? Um, <laughs> now, OK, th there are a lot of issues here, but let's take some of them away. Um, if we don't look at marriage as being about religion, or if we don't look at marriage as being about what sex you are, if we don't look at marriage as being uh, the children issue, and we look at it purely as about the issue of equal rights, I completely get this, absolutely get this. However, there is the other side of the coin, and that is marriage isn't in the eyes of a lot of people, about just equal rights. But I also think there's another way you can take it, not only the civil rights, but also basic human empathy, where, you know, that you've got a gay friend that, who is in a loving relationship, who wants to be involved in that committed relationship that we as married people have. And I think that that is kind of, you know, that, that human feeling of sympathy that Tamati should be able to get married to Tim to do what he wants because we love him and he loves his partner. And I think that's also another really good way to look at it because it's not just about rights it is about us as humans and as emotions as well and actually if you um, look at you could arguably say that heterosexual couples a lot of them take the institute of marriage very lightly mm. what's wrong with a group of people who so fervently believe in making a commitment to somebody that they want to be part of this institution fighting for that right shouldn't we encourage that but because some people take it lightly or abuse the institution of marriage it doesn't necessarily mm. sanction but, you, uh, others, but equally, it? opening it to more people doesn't denigrate it. I, I don't think Absolutely. your marriage is worth any less than if, t if Tamati is able to, to enter into one. No, so and, I, and actually, I'm just being what? painted as devil's advocate. Oh, no, 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 right no, 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 um, no, no, no. I'm only no, using you as not. an example. I know that's not what you're saying. Of course not, because it, at the end of the day, if Tamati gets married to Tim, it makes absolutely no difference in my life, except I, for the fact that two people who I like and respect will be happier. I think the difficulty I find with Bob McCroskey's Krosky's argument is that um, when he says, oh, but same-sex couple, same couples have their civil unions, it's a bit like saying oh, in apartheid South Africa, uh, black people had their own bars, so therefore you don't need to let them into yours. You can't argue that this is not about equality, mm. because it is. <clears throat> I was trying to think of a situation in society where I'm excluded from doing something. I've sort of been racking my brains to say, is there something in society I'm not allowed to engage or enter into because of my behaviour? And I can't think of anything, so that is an interesting mm. question to ask. I do understand the point that maybe once upon a time it was very much a religious institution. But it's so much more than that now. It's entered into our legal framework. It's part of our, the fabric of our society. And as part of that, and I said this in my article, as a tax-paying, law-abiding citizen of New Zealand, 
I should have that option just like everybody else. And not all so, heterosexuals, sorry, get married in church these days either. Sure, so that's right. I think that's why I think you've got to take the religious, religious side of yeah. it away because so much of it is civil marriage. Um, just out of interest, how much of this is about the law of being able to have children? Because I think the only, def the only mm -hmm. distinction at the moment between civil union and marriage is this adoption issue. Yeah. You can adopt as a single person, but you can't adopt as a, as a civil unionised couple. That's the one. <laughs> I can adopt um, by myself, and he has to be, Tim has to be Uncle Tim. So, you know, therefore... Um, or he can adopt, and I have to be Uncle, Uncle Tamati. So it's really just a legal little loophole that I think just needs to be tied up. I'm sure I know the answer to this, but just out of interest, were they to amend the adoption law rather than the marriage law, that wouldn't make any difference? Oh, no, I think that at the moment we've got this bill on the table and it, I think that it, it covers two birds with one stone yeah. and so let's, let's do it. Already, you can have your say on this issue too as we are running a poll on our Facebook page asking if same-sex couples should be able to marry. Here are the results so far. Well, 75% of you say, yes, they should. 25% disagree, thinking same-sex couples should not be... The marriage debate is certainly heating up. And politicians won't be escaping the attention of the public on this one with a conscience vote due today. Political editor Corin Dan is with us now. Corin, can we do a little bit of number crunching first up? Mm. How many politicians have already declared which way they're going to vote? Well, it's a little bit vague, uh, but maths are very important on days like today. So if we do, just do a little bit of number crunch, we know the Greens' 14 MPs are on board. They have declared that's the case. We think that there are about 30 of the 34 Labour MPs that will vote for it, certainly to select committee. Uh, Prime Minister John Key said yesterday around 12 national MPs are likely to vote. It could be slightly more, give or take one or two. Uh, we're looking probably the Māori Party su to support it, to select committees, so that's what, another three, maybe only two there, but, but certainly some support. Uh, and then you've got Hone Harawera, John Banks, Peter Dunn all backing it. New Zealand First, probably not, uh, but by my calculation that gets us to 62, which is enough to get it across the line to start with. But it's not a huge majority, you'd have to say. Um, there are others who are picking about 63 or 64. So it should get across the line today to start with. So let's talk about the significance of this first reading because I noticed that in the reporting lots of politicians are saying I'll vote for it this time. What does mm. it mean? That means that it's perfectly fine for them to change their mind or they want to see yeah. the way New Zealand wants to go? Yeah, they can change their mind and some might. What's going to happen? So it will be voted through tonight probably and then it will, then it will be sent to select committee where uh, this uh, small group of MPs will consider it. Now it's in that process that the public can turn up, give their submissions, and, and I would expect thousands of submissions on this, uh, this piece of legislation. Certainly there were thousands for the civil union legislation back a few years ago, I think like 5,000 or something. They won't be able to hear all the submissions, but those MPs will then hear arguments for and against, so it's reasonable to expect that some may choose to change their position once they've heard all the arguments. Of course, they'll also be lobbied pretty hard uh, in the interim. And then there's a second reading. What is the process beyond that? New Zealand gets to have its say, then what happens? Well, then it goes back to the House, uh, and in that process, it's like a debate of the whole House, the committee stage, as we call it. That's a long process where they go through bills sort of line by line, if you like. Um, that's a process, too, where they can make changes. People can try and make their own changes called uh, supplementary orders, uh, and people try and do that, make sort of amendments to it, if you like. That's the process for that. Uh, and then it goes to a third reading, and then it's through. But really, I think... The select committee process will be pretty crucial for this one, uh, hearing those arguments from the groups uh, opposed and for it, um, and that will give MPs some time also to be lobbied. I'm sure they will be, especially, um, you know, you can imagine those that are in marginal seats um, be very conscious, perhaps, of how some of their constituents will feel about which way they will vote. Looking at that idea of being lobbied, Jerry Brownlee said he's not declaring which way he's going to vote today because he doesn't, he can't be bothered being lobbied. But we will know which way every MP votes, won't we? Yeah, we'll be able to find out which way they voted. Um, look, you know, at the end of the day, they have to be able to stand up and say, stand up for for what they believe in. I think um, it's pretty, you know. It, most of them, and most of them have come through. We've been talking to them in the last few days in, in Parliament to do this. The odd one that doesn't, maybe they just simply can't make up their mind uh, right into the last minute. It is conceivable. All right, so a conscience vote seems entirely appropriate, and you think the numbers are there? I think the numbers are there for the first reading. Uh, they're a bit tighter than I thought they might be. I'll be interested to see what it is uh, uh, about uh, probably about six fifteen or six thirty tonight when it is finally voted through.
All right, Corinne Dan, political editor uh, from Parliament or Wellington. There.